Hello and welcome back to Mullet Over. This week is all about Garot Rogue, a notoriously difficult deck, so let's jump right in. When you get to the bottom of your deck and play Garot, it only takes a single draw effect to pull all the bleeds for a potential OTK. Each Garot shuffles in 3 bleeds to deal a base total of 8 damage, which doubles up to 16 with both copies played. Then you add 8 more for each tick of spell damage you get from Ethereal Og Merchant. With 2 copies of Ethereal Og Merchant and 2 copies of Shadow Step in the deck, the guaranteed max damage output is 48, although it can sometimes increase with spell damage golems from Kazakus and other discovered spell damage minions. Obviously, in most matchups, you don't actually need the full combo. Plus 2 spell damage for a total of 32 is usually enough to get the job done. And in some matchups, you might need even less or none at all because you've already dealt damage with your board. That board is usually composed of your many cheap battle cry and combo minions, which can be efficient enough to win games even without Garot. The tough part is identifying which plan to go for. Combo, board, or a mix of both. No matter which game plan you're going for though, two cards are absolutely essential. Field contact for your draw engine and efficient Octobot for discounts and speeding up the combo. Octobot is an insta-keep in every matchup, and in my experience, field contact is too. However, some players argue that in hyper-aggressive matchups such as Shadow Priest, you should throw away the contact if you don't already have Octobot. Without the contact though, you risk gassing out in the mid-game, which is why Okashinsuke keeps it even when against Face Hunter. Okay, say you've got your Octobot, but how early are you supposed to play it? That's largely matchup dependent. Versus Shadow Priest, Face Hunter, and the Mirror, you usually play it straight away on turn 2. That's because these decks usually don't have a way of dealing 4 or more damage from minion attacks or spells early in the game. But they do want to get on board, so you can get the activation without having to expend another card from hand. In these matchups, you don't need that many discounts because you don't need to empty your deck and use the combo for victory. Octobot can get you enough tempo to win the board instead. When Luna drops the Octo on Curve versus Killin' all day, he spends the whole turn hitting it with his dagger so she can't get any more than 4 discounts. He could have played his own Octobot to go even on the discounts, but maybe he was worried about a prize plunderer coming back the other way. When he goes with the Octo on board for turn 3, Luna gladly punishes with a 4 damage plunderer during her field contact turn. From there, she runs away with tempo and wins without a scratch. Against Quest Shaman, Octobot without an immediate proc is a consideration, but a bit risky because they run Novice Zapper, which can help their damage spells take down the Octo in one hit. Versus Viper on turn 3, Casey elects to use his Guardian Og Merchant to protect his Foxy Fraud rather than activate his Octobot, which gets him a more favorable trade. This is a reasonable risk to take because Viper only had one natural card plus one generated card in hand at the time, so Casey expects to proc the Octo from a board trade. When Okashinsuke faces Alutamu's face hunter, he hesitates quite a bit before deciding to drop down the Octo. That's because Alutamu runs Guardian Og Merchant, which could potentially put this Bone Chewer Brawler to 4 attack and deny an Octo proc. With Alutamu having kept the Brawler and one other card in hand, it's definitely scary. But Okashinsuke does not want to wait and use Prize Plunderer to activate on turn 3, because he loses a removal tool and takes a lot of damage in the meantime. The risk pays off big when Alutamu shows he doesn't have the right box. Matchups where you don't usually just play Octo on curve include Handlock and Quest Mage. Versus Handlock, Octo can die in one hit to unstable Shadow Blast. Versus Mage, it isn't actually that likely for them to kill it, but usually it's not worth giving them the target for free spells that early. In both matchups, you have time to accumulate more cards for Octo to discount, and you're also more likely to need to get to the bottom of your deck for the combo, so it's better to wait. We've seen players be brave with Octobot, but when Rami faces Dmitry Kazov on Quest Shaman, he takes a calculated risk with Field Contact instead. Turn 1 Tempo Guardian Og Merchant may look unusual, but Rami knows Dimitri doesn't want to spend any removal tools and overload into his turn 3, so the Og Merchant gets a bonus clear on the totem before Rami reveals its real purpose, stepping it back to the hand so he can coin out and protect his field contact. Preloading the mana for field contact potentially allows Rami to draw tons while also removing the average board Dimitri can develop the next turn. Shaman would need 2 spells to clear here. With a Perpetual Flame in hand, Dimitri ends up finding the other removal from Guidance, but I still think Rami's creative play was a justified risk. 
the quest shaman matchup can be tricky like that because sometimes they go for high tempo starts and pressure you but if they get a slow hand you might want to draw more cards before octobot or field contact ever even hit the board Tice keeps Swindle as a guaranteed draw effect when he faces Bunny Hopper, which is a bit hard to combo on the play, but just goes to show how much he values card draw in the matchup. By turn 3, with no more draw effects in hand, Tice realizes he will have to stall and picks Flame Strike from his Wand Thief. It's great foresight because with Preparation or Octobot, he can get the AoE relatively early and punish any aggressive hands from Shaman, which Bunny absolutely has. With help from Penflinger and Brain Freeze, the Flame Strike sweeps up Bunny's entire board and buys Ty's tons of time to put together the combo. When you won't be under much pressure, Shroud of Concealment is an excellent keep to thin your deck and get more discounts with Octobot. RDU's opening hand versus Psycho's handlock is near perfect. The Guardian Og Merchant kept just to be an activator for Octo. He coins out the first Shroud when he sees he can play the second one on turn 3 for a total of 8 cards discounted when he procs the Octo on turn 4. This of course means tons of free draws as soon as he gets field contact, but he wisely chooses to commit some of these battle cries to take the board and buy time to actually find the contact. Versus Quest Mage, Shroud is doubly amazing because it's one of your few ways to draw cards without putting a minion on board. Although not every list includes it, Penflinger can be quite useful in the matchup for a similar reason. On turn 5, Possessi does a small field contact draw turn, using his Penflinger to kill off the Guardian Og Merchant, and then Shadow Step to bounce the field contact and the Flinger back, stranding Lambie's free spells. Cult Neophyte can also be an effective delay tactic when played on curve, especially versus Quest Shaman to deny Feral Spirit and Serpent Shrine Portal, and the Mirror to deny Shroud of Concealment or any plays with the coin. Another key card to look at is Secret Passage, which has tons of utility. When it's still too early to go off with Field Contact, one of your best possible turns is using Passage to delete some cards in your deck, sometimes even if the minions kill each other off. Or better yet, pick up cards that go into your original hand if you Passage into Shadow Step or further card draw. If you run dry of cheap battle cries and combos in hand, you can also Passage in the middle of the turn to keep a Field Contact train going. But always count how many cards were in your pre-passage hand lest you overdraw a crucial combo piece. Also, if you draw too many cards post-passage, you lose cards from the right-hand side of your original hand. No clips of this in GM of course, but I have definitely made this mistake. When facing Weapon Rogue, Brute Demon Hunter, or any druid that plays Lady Anaconda, it's wise to play Garot Rogue like an aggro deck and pressure on board before they can get to their win condition. When Luna faces Brute DH, she keeps Foxy Fraud as a guaranteed turn 1 with upside if she picks up Swindle or Wand Thief. She gets Octobot and plays that instead, as the only way Brute DH can kill it this early without procking it is exactly double Fury. With the Spirit Jailer already on board, Fled is essentially forced to activate it for her, and she capitalizes with 5 minions already on board by turn 2, trying to win before a Brute ever comes online. Not everyone runs Kazakas and Garot Rogue because it's expensive, but its flexibility is unmatched. While its most common usage is to pull a 1 cost Battlecry Golem for the Field Contact Train or Spell Damage to replace an Ethereal Aug Merchant, you can use it to get a buff Golem when you know you're going to be ahead on board. McBanterface keeps Kazakas with Octobot and Ethereal Aug Merchant for the guaranteed proc when he faces Dreadeye's Brute Demon Hunter. He coins out the Octo, and Dreadeye procs it to minimize discounts, but with a handful of Og Merchants and plenty of 2 drops he could top deck, McBanterface gets a perfect swarm onto the board, followed up by Kazakas. While the 5 cost Golem is tempting to take here, he knows the 1 cost buff is enough pressure to end the game and is better versus Glide. With the Poison keyword, he has enough damage on board for lethal even through 2 Ironbound roots. There were tons of game-ending Kazakas golems in week 3, both 1 cost and 5 cost. To figure out which one you actually take, you have to visualize your curve and expected board state, which means sometimes a reactive Kazakas is best. When Blitzchung faces Shaxi's handlock, his field contact is nowhere to be seen, so he takes poison plus deal 3 to 2 enemy minions for his golem, allowing him to answer flesh giants and goldshire gnolls. He even immediately shadow steps the 5 cost golem so he can kill more threats, a very creative stall tactic. Speaking of, shadow step is probably the trickiest card to maneuver in the deck. When Possessi faces Surrender's quest shaman, he has an obvious Octobot activation turn and the possibility to save the step for his field contact. 
He chooses to immediately step the Octobot instead though, in order to discount the cards he'll get from the field contact. This is the higher tempo option, indicating that he doesn't feel like he'll lack card draw, a reasonable assumption given that he likely finds Shroud or second field contact during the pop-off next turn. And during this big turn, he's careful not to waste any discounts by playing most of his zero-cost cards for draw before proccing the Octobot again. And later on, when he realizes he still needs to draw 4 cards before the Garot OTK is guaranteed, he uses the second Shadow Step for field contact. Depending on the situation, you can of course use Shadow Step on other targets. For example, Cult Neophyte is great versus spell-based druids, and Prize Plunderer is great versus aggro, but with all the moving parts to this deck, nothing is out of the question. With its high power level and even higher skill ceiling, everything in this video is just a guideline when it comes to Garot Rogue. It's only with practice and experience that you can truly master it, and I expect our Grandmasters to keep showing us new ways to pilot it as the weeks go on. Catch you next time!